All right, welcome everyone to the March 2022 special Pi Day edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club podcast. A special thank you goes out to our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO for making this possible. And as a reminder, the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. And we believe it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to help build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. And here with our PCRF Journal Club, we're going to be taking a closer look at some of the latest research happening in EMS. And I am Remley Crow, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tony Fernandez and Dr. Bill Toon. The name of the article that we are reviewing today is Medication Errors in Pediatric Patients After Implementation of a Field Guide with Volume-Based Dosing that was recently published in Pre-Hospital Emergency Care. And as always, this discussion is paired with an article written by our very own columnist, Dr. Tony Fernandez, in EMS World called Journal Watch. So we encourage you all to check out this article at emsworld.com under the category of Education and Training. I want to take a moment to thank the audience for being with us here today. And as we begin, I'd like to remind you that you can use your chat feature at any point on the screen, type in questions and comments, and we'll be bringing those into the discussion as we go. And so with that, let's go ahead and kick this off, right, Tony? Dive in. Okay, so this study was focused on, a, on using a field guide as a way to increase the proportion of correct medication doses given to pediatric patients. And so I think that this is an important topic for a number of reasons. We've seen that there are a ton of barriers to giving medication to children in the pre-hospital setting. And so Tony, I'll turn it to you. What are some of the barriers that we know of when it comes to giving any medication to children in the pre-hospital setting? Well, so I think it's a, it's a bit of a blessing um, that we often don't see really sick or injured patients uh, pre hospitally they make up a luckily a, a smaller proportion of our overall call volumes but that also can be a curse in that when when there are field providers who encounter a really sick or injured patient they might not feel confident or fully prepared to take care of that patient um, so things like dosing medications or just overall comfort with taking care of a, a, a small child um, really can impact how that that care is provided and um, it's not like we have in in the hospital where there are a ton of resources to to help you make sure you have these these medications and doses correct. Um, it's it's you. It might just be two two people in the back of an ambulance uh, figuring this out. So that can be really stressful, particularly when you haven't done it uh, in a long time. And I'll tell you what, if you ask me to do math right now on the fly, um, and I'm under no stress, but talking to one of my best friends in the world, um, I probably be a little nervous in front of all these people uh, doing any calculation. Um, and when it really matters, that can be a really tough thing to get, to get over. Absolutely. I mean, I wear a calculator on my wrist and I'm still nervous if I had to do some math right now. So that's one of the, the big barriers that we see time and time again. Um, and, you know, we've been focusing a lot on analgesia recently in the pre-hospital setting, and we've certainly seen some of these barriers come into play there. Um, in addition to the low frequency, high criticality that you mentioned, we see uh, barriers like routes. Getting IV access in a very small child is often challenging. And, you know, just sat on part of a panel for an evidence-based guideline on pain management and uh, talking about alternate routes was a huge piece of that. Can we do something like IN fentanyl or IN ketamine? Uh, and these become really important. And so in the background of this, we see that Pediatric dosing errors are not all that uncommon when they are measured, and we know that there's challenges to measuring these as well. Uh, one study in here reported something like incorrect doses for epinephrine of 21 to 72 percent of all doses given. So there's clearly, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah and there's the idea. other one they mentioned was uh, Benadryl diphenhydramine up to 93 percent. Um, that's that's really scary. Uh, just just that it could be that wrong that often. For sure. And you know, a number of interventions have been put out to try to address this kind of a gap and some of them relying on like a length based tape. And then this particular study was looking at an innovative approach that combines some of the things that we have been doing with also age based dosing. Uh, so the authors here wanted to study whether or not using a, a primarily age based dosing mechanism would help reduce error. So this eliminates the need for the complex math that you mentioned. 
um, and that there is still a length based tape when needed. So let's say that we can't get the age of the patient um, or that the, the patient might be uh, large or small for age and we want to use that instead. So this was the hand heavy system and I think in the appendix they show us a sample of what that looked like and it's worth mentioning and I'm sure some folks in the audience are very familiar with this one but essentially uh, here's a card for a seven-year-old and so it has the agency specific formulary on what medications for what indications can be given and that way often at dispatch we're able to collect patient age and that allows us to dive right in and to even make that pre-plan as we're arriving on, well, how much of this medication would I likely have to give? Uh, so I thought that was a particularly innovative approach and was very interested to see what the results are of taking out the complex math and using this age-based system instead, a field guide. Yeah, and as I mean, as you look at this, you can see this is this is much easier than having to pull out a calculator um, or even worse, doing math in your head. This is this this certainly a uh, Looks like it'll, it would facilitate correct dosing. Yeah, and uh, I'm also really curious because they did a great job at talking about which way the dosing errors went. So in some of those uh, reports that we just talked about in the introduction, it didn't really say what which way the dosing error went. And I know that you mentioned, hey, we don't really see children all that often. I'm kind of hesitant to get, I certainly don't want to give kid too much medication, but could we be doing harm also by underdosing? particularly when it comes to things like seizure or status epileptic. If we have a kid who's actively seizing, uh, not giving a large enough dose the first time could slow us down from being able to stop that seizure at all. Uh, so I, I think it was important that they looked at both ways. And I, I don't want to steal your thunder. I know we're going to go into the methods, but that was something that I wanted to highlight. Yeah, I, and you know, just you talked a little earlier about um, pain meds and analgesia and underdosing there would certainly um, also, well, underdosing and overdosing could have could overdosing obviously could have uh, un, unintended consequences. But underdosing that pain medication, you're really not helping the patient as you intend. Right. If we're not within the therapeutic window, we're certainly not doing any help. That's that's really important. And some of these medications have a wide therapeutic window, and we'll talk about how they accounted for that. There was a way of looking at uh, dosing that I thought was particularly interesting. But first, let's get started. I'll let you start into the methods. Let's talk a little bit about study setting because we know how important that is. And I know I'm gonna mention the parachute study again anyway. <laughs> we know that if we're not testing these things in context and in settings that are likely to look like our own settings, that it's really hard to generalize findings. But in this case, this was done in a pre-hospital setting. And Tony, you can tell us a little bit about exactly where it was conducted. Yeah, so this was an interesting setting. So they, this was this was a, uh, the provider was a single service that was responsible for all 911 in the city and surrounding areas. Um, it was primarily a single tier, all 911, I'm sorry, all ALS service, um, but they did have BLS first response. Um, they indicated that the surrounding area was uh, about 155 square miles with a population of about 700,000, and they had about 118,000 calls annually amongst 215 paramedics. So yeah, I think um, and that, that call volume is really important because if we're studying something that is low frequency and high criticality, having a call volume of 100,000 upwards per year is going to give us enough sample size to be able to see if a change has actually occurred after they implemented this improvement intervention. Yeah, absolutely. And it helps. It certainly helps that their study period was more than a year. Um, because like we've been saying, finding those those children, especially the children who required medication administration, um, it would, would be difficult with, with a smaller call volume. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so they this was a, a retrospective study and um, they looked at this was they looked at all children less than 13 years of age. Um, and I thought that that was interesting. Um, that they picked 13 years of age. So they were really looking at, at, at the smaller children, not the adolescents and the like. Um, and it was it was interesting how they did so their, their baseline period was 2014. And they implemented hand heavy in 2015 with this with their additional length based tape. Uh, and they waited, they, they let, which is a great idea, they let the intervention uh, filter through and, and uh, they didn't start their analysis or their, their post period, their field guide study period, what they call it, until July of 2017. Um, and that study period went to June of 2019. So they 
they certainly had uh, a, a wealth of calls to identify the, the patients, the pediatric patients, particularly the ones who needed medication. Um, their primary outcome was the percentage of correct doses. And this is what we talked about, before, what we uh, hinted at before. Um, they defined correct doses as uh, administering any dose within 80 to 120% of the field guide dose by age. And they indicated that one, this was consistent with prior literature, but two, Remley, as you discussed before, um, this, this has something to do with the, the therapeutic win window of these medications. Right, absolutely. And I, you've already hit on a couple of really key points here that I wanna make sure we pick up on. So first, the decision of where to cut make a cut point for pediatric patient. That's always controversial. And you know, if you've seen one definition, you've seen one definition. So it is important that they were looking at children younger than 13. And then later we'll see in the results, they stratify this out even further because it's not likely that a one-year-old is the same as a 13-year-old in our mental models when we go out to treat these patients. For sure, no, absolutely. Um, so, and during their baseline period, they use the same cutoff, uh, 80 to 120. However, rather than it being uh, by age, um, of course, because they were using the length-based tape. This was um, based on the recorded weight for the child. So it, really interesting study that before uh, implementation and after. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting was they had a change in software vendor uh, during the study period from baseline to uh, after hand heavy was implemented to their field guide study period. Um, they used two separate software vendors and they had to merge data for analysis, which um, I commend the authors for this because this, it might sound easy, but working with two separate systems and then merging data into both systems for analysis, that was probably a pretty heavy lift uh, for, for them. To, and to this get didn't them. get mentioned, but just looking at the years of the study, I'd wager that they also had a Nemesis version change during that time I period. So that. I would guess that Nemesis version two was at the beginning of the time period, and then there was a move to Nemesis version three. And for our audience, we talk about Nemesis a lot, and this is really important. This is the National EMS Information System. It's our data standard in EMS. So independent of whatever software you use, you're going to be collecting some of these same national elements in a uniform format. And that lets us make comparisons across agencies and in these large national research data sets. Uh, EMS does a really good job at this. We've used a lot of hospital data in some of our studies and we see that that same standardization isn't always there. So there may be standardization within facilities, but between facilities is really challenging. Now, when we talk about version changes in NEMSYS, every couple of years, uh, a different version of the data dictionary comes out. And sometimes there are large changes and sometimes the changes are, are less substantial, but the change from NEMSYS version two to version three was a pretty substantial change in terms of how certain data elements got collected. And I think we'll see this also when we talk when we start talking about their table one, we'll talk about uh, patient characteristics and those were collected different between versions. So in addition to the, the software change, my guess is there was also a data standard change during that same time frame. I bet you're right. And there, from NEMSYS, we won't geek out too much on NEMSYS, but from NEMSYS version two to version three, the, the way they collected medications, uh, it, it was different. Um, so this was this is certainly uh, something that just challenges that they had to wade through that you don't necessarily um, always think about when you're talking about the complexities of a study. Um, and this was this was certainly some challenges and barriers there. So I commend yeah, the authors. They did a lot of started. work to get here, I, I guarantee. So the authors should certainly be commended on all of the work to make the data into one data set that they were able to analyze for the study. And it was really interesting how they analyzed these records. So they had, they looked through all the records where a medication was administered. They had one author, um, I believe it was the lead author, looked through all of the medications. Yep, the lead author looked through any record where a medication was administered. And then among those records, they identified the records where there was uh, an error or the, the, the author identified it as an error. Those records were then reviewed by a second author um, to confirm that it was in fact an error. So they did that for everything during the field guide study period. And then I thought it was really uh, a really smart idea for what they did for the baseline period. Rather than have to review all, have one author review every record for the entire baseline study period. They had one author review the first six months of the year and the second author, well, actually it was January through July. 
the second author review June through December. And then they did some analysis to see just in June, since both authors reviewed June, to see how they aligned um, in what they found in June. And they found that there was 100% agreement um, between the authors and what they found in June of 2014. So they could feel pretty confident on the first six months and the last six months that uh, the information was, was uh, pretty uniform. So that is a really important point, and we talk a lot about inter-rater reliability, and so it was great that to see that, well, a month of overlap gave sufficient uh, evidence to say, okay, well, I think we're, we're grading these the same way, and we don't need to make any adjustments to the rubric that we're using for identifying these. Yeah, no, that's that's big, and that, that, that certainly um, probably saved them a, a lot of time. Just, as you and I know, reading these charts, um, can you, you, it can be tough and your eyes can start to glaze over and you start to uh, see the same patient or it looks like the same patient over and over again. So I laugh because I have a couple hundred in my queue. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the question. Minimizing um, that workload is certainly uh, is, is certainly valuable. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the paramedic did and how they identified the 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 age and the weights of the patient. So it yeah. the authors note that the paramedics, they first looked for a caretaker or a, a parent to give them the, the patient's age. Um, this was during the field guide study period. Uh, and if they did not, if there was no one on scene who can give an estimate of the patient's age, that's when they, they went to the length-based tape um, during the field guide study period. During the baseline study period, they it was similar, but they were looking for weights. And they had, if, if there was not uh, an estimate of weight, then they, they actually used, at the time, they used the Braslow tape. Yeah, I think that's an important point to talk about, you know, when we're talking about, if I want to compare my agency to this, I need to know, well, what was their agency doing before this, and does that look like what my agency might be doing now? And so, yes, they used the Braslow tape. Uh, but the point to highlight there is that, again, is the weight-based calculation, which requires us to go from uh, weight to volume in order to actually administer the medication in most cases. And that's where that complex math comes in. Yep, that's the math that uh, certainly we want to avoid in high stress situations. They do note, though, that the paramedics did have access to online protocols during the baseline period and uh, the um, the field guide study period. So uh, there were there were some similarities, but there's there's a big difference in how not doing math is is a very important difference there. Absolutely. Um, so as we go through the paper, let's let's talk about some of their exclusions, and I think they made some really wise choices here. Um, first, they excluded nebulized medications. Uh, they also excluded any paramedic, any calls where the paramedic had to actually call medical direction, uh, uh, or if the medication fell outside of the field guide protocols. Right. So these are obviously things that are much different uh, than than your typical call, and it makes sense that that they excluded these. Right, those would be special circumstances. And so it's smart to either treat them in a separate bucket or to exclude them in this case, especially I liked the idea that they had the foresight to think about, well, if medical direction was called, you're probably gonna get the dose in a different way, the instruction to give the dose. And so it doesn't make sense to include that with the real world setting of when you're out there by yourself with your field guide, how do you perform? So I, I also agree, I think those were wise decisions. Absolutely. I know that you'll love this. Um, their continuous variables were presented in medians, not means. Um, I and, did love that. Thank <laughs> you. And uh, for anyone who's uh, not understanding why Raymond and I are chuckling, mean, medians are uh, this is your the, the middle number essentially, and it makes more sense that we talked about math, right? And an average or your mean your mean is a mathematical equation where if you have something that an outlier that is really big or really small, that can drive your mean in either up or down in a way that makes it really hard to uh, make estimates uh, um, for, with particularly when you have small numbers. Um, so using the medians and interquartile ranges, that was a wise decision here. Don't get me started on average examples. <laughs> you know, if you have your head in the freezer and your feet in the oven, on average, you feel fine. <laughs> and that is the uh, most podcast appropriate example I could give. You can come to me for some other ones offline. Um, but I do think that that's there, important. She has some great ones. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And there's some memes to go with. But I, I do think that's important. And they use the right type of test that goes along with non-parametric or non-normally distributed data. And so what this means is that we think that there probably are some extremes on either side, especially if we're talking about, you know, 
what dose was given? Well, there's probably some small ones and probably some big ones. And a lot of that has to do with patient uh, ages that were likely to be included. Uh, so I like that they used the Man Whitney U test, which uh, another fun fact for your statistics day is that Man Whitney U and Wilcox and Ranksum are actually the same test discovered around the same time by different people. So they could have oh, written yeah. either one. Yeah. Out. yeah. Um, they also, and this I love that a, a lot of their analysis was performed in Excel. And this, I, I like to point that out uh, to particularly to our audience to show that you don't necessarily have to have uh, a, a, a sophisticated statistical program to do research. Um, a lot of it can be done in Excel. And um, they also use R, which I believe R is still a free program. Is that right? I Dr. think Pro? it is free. And there's a lot of um, open source resources available. So as much as I'm a Stata person and it pains me to talk about R, R is a good resource and it is out there on YouTube. There's lots of how-to videos for getting started on that. Uh, and I, I think that is an important point. I also like that simpler is often better, especially when we're trying to communicate an actionable finding like this one. So this could largely be an improvement project at any individual agency. This is a nice little roadmap to follow. Uh, and I like that when we can describe things in percentages, in medians, uh, it's a lot easier to communicate that. We will see that they took on some more complex analysis to try to control for potential confounding variables. And that's important too, especially when we see that the effect holds and, and stays in the same direction and near the same magnitude. Uh, but I like it when, you know, we can tell this in the simplest of the simple and it still has meaning. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like we have a question here I wanted to get to. Oh. Um, so it was about the field guide and uh, Rebecca asked why does the field guide have some generic and some brand names um, so those are customized to the agency and that might be what the agency requested that's a really important point of this is that you know this system and the system has probably changed since the time of implementation but it is completely customized to the agency's formulary. So my guess is that this agency had certain preferences for certain brand names to say um, versus the actual generic name itself. But that, that's a great pickup there. That is a great question. Are you giving us thoughts on that? Um, no, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head there. That was that was likely uh, probably something that uh, the agency had, and I think it's wise for um, any software program to work as intended for the agency right so if the agency and the and the providers in the agency are used to calling benadryl benadryl and not diphenhydramine um let's make the study guide say benadryl even though um we're going to put things like amiodarone on there as well because the, the whole point of this not just doing math um, is to make things easier on the provider so they have to think less and if that's what they do in the field I, I say we go, it's a so good I, idea. I think this is a really important point too, um, that it is customized to the formulary and making sure that this can be updated quickly is really important. I know that there's an app-based version of this program now, which I think gives more of that flexibility, especially how many drug shortages has, have we seen recently. So if let's say that the concentration is out that you usually use, and now we're talking about dilution, uh, that can have major implications for medication errors and where the provider doesn't even pick up on a medication error happen because it doesn't get documented as one. So that's a really important point is having this so flexible and adaptable to the local setting and to be able to update it really quickly when we do see changes in the medication availability. That's a game changer for drug dosing errors in my book as well. Yep, yep I agree. So we have a good comment here from William um, says that uh, there are lessons to be learned from our anesthesia critical care colleagues in the hospital um, that are not being extrapolated to the EMS environment. I'm um, going to give some, some uh, examples of why, and I think that we certainly want to learn from our colleagues. Uh, there, there are, uh, while we can't, we, in, in the field, we, we certainly probably will never have all the resources that they have in hospital. Uh, for dosing and medication administration, there there are there are lessons to learn from in hospital. There are lessons to learn from uh, the airlines industry. Uh, there are there are certainly things that we can take from other fields to bring in to improve our patient care. I agree with that. I love that. And this opens us up to the broader conversation around a culture of safety and EMS. I, currently, you know, aviation has ways of reporting near misses, and we do to some extent, but it's not consistent across settings. And I, I think that's an important piece to have is 
to be able to speak up when we see, hey, this didn't cause an error this time, but ooh, I was really close to grabbing amiodarone and I wanted something else that starts with an A. I was trying to go for the atropine, for example, but they're both in blue bottles and they both have really small fonts. Um, a few years ago, I had the pleasure of working on a study uh, on packaging and it's so interesting. I love it when we blend different fields at EMS. And so this is really interesting to me is that we looked at um, how packaging plays a role in the EMS environment, not just in errors, but in a lot of things. So if the numbers on the ET tubes are really tiny and we're working in a confined space and you know, without the best lighting all of the time, how easy or hard is it for us to pick up the right piece of equipment? And then with medications, you can imagine that can magnify a lot of different times. What if the packaging changes and fentanyl used to always come in green and then one day we get a different supplier and now it's blue and you know, I have that mental model of I go look for the green and I grab the green. Are medication errors likely to change around those times when we see changes in packaging? Uh, and then you start to think about, well, there's all these different improvement ideas out there around how to prevent that from happening. How do we make sure that we're sharing those best practices, whether, you know, that be through peer reviewed publication, there certainly are quality improvement guidelines for publishing these kinds of things, um, or whether that be through podcasts and journals and how can we get the word out about when we do find something that works really well, how to replicate it. Absolutely. So <clears throat> we've done a fair amount of geeking out on the methods, which I love, but I think it might be time uh, to talk some about what, what these authors found. I like that idea. Let's move into the results uh, and keep the discussion coming. We have some great book recommendations on why hospitals should fly ultimate. That sounds interesting. I love this idea of bringing in um, culture of safety and some of these ways of error prevention that aviation has been around a long time and they've implemented a lot of these practices into their culture. So I think that's a great place to look. But without further ado, let's move into what they saw. So this is from the intervention period we see that they started off with about 7,600 total patient encounters. And then of those, only 8% received any medication. So this goes back to what you were talking about, Tony, that it, even when we do see pediatric patients, giving a medication isn't all that common. And then we see the exclusions that we mentioned that make a lot of sense around removing nebulized medications, they're dosed in different ways, and then removing medications that were ordered with, with consult uh, via online medical direction. So that left them with a total of 375 patients who were in the final analysis. And this was in that intervention period again. So they were gonna look at uh, what number of these patients or these encounters resulted in a medication dosing error. And in the baseline period, just to let you all know, there were 206 patient encounters. And so they have a lot of nice comparisons that we'll be able to walk through here with that baseline control group. And this just emphasizes yeah, how important it is to have the appropriate uh, population size because you can see they lost almost half um, from their exclusions, which are appropriate exclusions, but it does uh, sometimes wreak havoc on your sample size. That's a great point. Yeah, the sample size can dwindle pretty quickly when we're talking about high frequency, low, crit you know, or high criticality, low frequency events, excuse me. Uh, very important to consider, but 375 is a good sample size to look at this. And so the next thing that they did, and I like how this follows the typical you know, research cookie cutter here, we have our figure one that tells us the flow of patients. And now we're gonna have table one, which shows us who made it into the study. Uh, so now we're taking a look at the baseline patient demographics compared to the field study guide or field guide study period. So what we see here, or what I would be looking for as a reader is, whether there was anything majorly different between these two groups. Tony, you mentioned some time elapsed between uh, implementation, there was a run-in period. And so I'd wanna know, was there anything majorly different about these two groups? Uh, so we see that the median age in both groups was about eight to nine years old, no real difference there. The proportion of male patients was about the same at 60-ish percent between them. And then this is the part where we talk about, perhaps there was a data standard change in addition to the software. Uh, they were not able to collect patient race and ethnicity in the pre-period. So while there was no comparison here, we might say, well, why even bother publishing it then? Well, this sets up for future studies. I'm really glad that they put this information here. Tony and I have talked a lot about these inequities in care and what we're looking for here, I, I think it's worth highlighting, is that uh, we're not looking for biological mechanisms when we talk about race and ethnicity in these cases for the most part. 
And so what this allows us to see is whether there could be potential implicit bias in some of the medication administration or in some of the outcomes that we're looking at. Uh, and that lets us look for ways to intervene upstream. So I do think that this is a really important point and I'm glad that it was included. Yeah, and even though they can't make their own comparisons to their baseline, by them including this in the study, this allows other folks who want to replicate this in their systems to make comparisons to at least the field guide study period, which I think is extremely valuable. Right, and I, I know it's one of those uncomfortable conversations, right? Nobody wants to wake up and think that, well, possibly, you know, some implicit bias or something that goes really in direct contrast to what I consciously believe could be playing a role. And so having this, this data on aggregate is really important so that we can start to see these and look for ways to intervene if we do see them. I know we, we use this quote a lot from our friend Mike Tagman that there's two sorts of EMS systems, those who are using their data to improve inequities and those who haven't looked. Um, and so this is really important uh, and I'm, I'm again, very glad to see that in a table one. So let's move into some of their outcomes. I'll move us over for those of you who are following along on audio only. We're going to table two, which is their comparison of the correct doses by medication. And I like that they broke it out by each medication. I, I think that's an important thing to consider because again, Tony, you mentioned some of these medications, we probably don't even use that frequently even within an already infrequent event. Uh, so it's really key to look at these. Uh, some, some overall statistics to talk about here. Correct doses under the new mechanism were given about 90% of the time, which is a major improvement from the pre-period, which was about half had correct dosing in the, in the control period. And now they also went one step further. Remember there was that therapeutic window that we talked about in their measure definition, but they looked at the proportion of patients who got the exact correct dose, and that was 70% in that intervention period, which I think is a major improvement. Statistics aside, we don't even need statistical significance on that one. That's clinically relevant. Yeah, agreed. Um, so they, they talk about the different medications individually here. And one of the things, if I was looking at table two, it's really large. And so one of the things I might want to start looking at is just the actual N, which medications were given most frequently. So, and they're the ones we might expect, right? Epinephrine, fentanyl. Um, some of the midazolam for seizure. And this is a really nice table too, because it tells us what indications they had authorized. We talk about that a lot too. Understanding the intent of each medication is really important. Um, so here again, midazolam was for status epilepticus or seizure. Fentanyl was given for pain. These are important considerations for us as we look at them. Um, so in, overall, there were 51 cases where an incorrect dose was given. 41% of those 51 or 21 cases were cases of overdose where too big a dose was given. Uh, and 59% were errors the other way, so underdosing. And the medications involved are important. So in some of the overdose group, we saw that IV fentanyl was one of the biggest, uh, the one of the biggest um, cases in that group. And then in underdosing, we see that IN midazolam and IM epi were some of the more commonly underdosed medications. So this has implications again, we you know take this a step further and think about patient outcomes. Did this cause harm or could it have potentially caused harm? Uh, certainly important to think about, particularly with seizure, seizure cessation. We've seen this uh, recent publication on national level that underdosing of that first dose can be really important because we know that the quicker we stop the seizure, the more likely we are to stop it for good. Um, so those were a couple of my thoughts on this table. Tony, I'll, I'll let you chime in. Yeah, and there was, I mean, this this kind of goes back to a little bit what we were talking about earlier, why reporting medians is, is so important. There was one instance where a patient, um, there were four instances where patients received twice the appropriate dose of fentanyl. There was one instance where uh, the largest overdose, the authors noted, was uh, three times the appropriate dose for solumedrol. So if you were just looking at means there, your means would be certainly be skewed. Um, Absolutely. And then they did, uh, so yeah, we, we talked about the most overdose medications were midazolam and fentanyl. Um, the largest underdose was uh, a tenfold underdose for IM Epi 1 to 1,000. Um, so you can see there's there's going to be some uh, some therapeutic window uh, uh, problems when you're when you're dosing that low, um, but those would also skew the numbers if we were going with means rather than medians. 
For sure. And what I would take away from this, you know, if I was like, what am I going to do with this study? How could I apply it at my own service? The first thing I would do is look at some of those ones where it's given frequently enough that if I were to undertake this as a quality improvement project, I wouldn't have to wait forever to know whether or not a change was really an improvement. So we talk about things like the fentanyl, the epi, uh, midazolam was given more frequently in the study. Uh, whereas those other medications are really important and we should certainly be watching for them and, and talking about them. But if we were to take a quality improvement project with just those medications stratified like that, it would be really challenging to know whether or not our changes resulted in what we were hoping for. Um, so that's one of my key takeaways from that table. And then we can go to the next table here for table three. This is still comparing the actual which way the overdose and underdose went um, for which medications. And I actually go to the second page of table three here. Again, we see midazolam is the area that really stuck out to me. I'm uh, thinking that there's a lot of potential room for industry-wide impact if we were to repeat this study and see at other agencies that, oh, we're hesitant to give that first big dose of IM midazolam. Uh, another key recommendation around midazolam for status epilepticus has to do with route. So we're seeing which routes are the most common. We can see IVIO was the most frequently used, uh, followed by IM, but in a patient with status epilepticus, uh, our modalities might change. And, and that's something that's hard to tease apart from uh, EPCR data. And so I think the study did stratify these appropriately, but if we were to be able to isolate to just status patients, we wanna see that IM dose at the right dose the first time. To, to get that medication on board quickly. Yeah, I agree. And this this table is um, it, it's very there's it's very useful um, because you have if if you look at look down the columns, um, not only do they give you the percent overdose, but they give you the percent underdose. So you can mm -hmm. really make some estimates on how this medication is being used or misused. Absolutely. So I, I really love, we're getting some great discussion and I'm very thankful for the audience for participating. They've stolen my thunder with two of my discussion points though. <laughs> I really love this. Uh, so let's talk about Brian's point. Brian is, mentions that there's some limitations to using EPCR data for medication errors. And I kind of hinted at this earlier and I agree a thousand percent. The You're only gonna detect what they knowingly did. What about the case where a dilution wasn't performed or whatever it might be and a different dose was given from what was documented? Oh, that's a huge piece of this. And so I completely agree. The suggestion here is, well, what about some direct observation studies in addition to something from the EPCR study? I think that that's a great next step and a natural next step to this study. So this study set us a baseline and using retrospective data to say, is there a question here worth investigating? And is this something we need to continue to explore is a great first step, but then taking it that step further with prospective observational, actual watching studies would be a great next step, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. It sounds like Brian's got some research in his future. That's a great idea. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, there's some studies to be conducted. Uh, I'm gonna move us over here to our last table before we dive fully into the rest of the discussion. And so this is that breakdown that I really liked. I've been working uh, with a number of uh, pediatric emergency medicine board of physicians. And this is something that comes up time and time again is the breakdown within pediatric age groups. Because we mentioned, you know, a 12 year old is probably not the same as a one year old when it comes to our thoughts and our fears around administering a medication. And so they did break this down. I thought it was interesting that we don't see that much variation under the new method with the number of correct doses. We see a little bit of wavering, but there isn't this dose response. So again, because some of these groups are really small, like the number of zero you know, to one-year-olds that we're seeing was 15, it's not surprising to see a little bit of variation, but I don't know that this you know, would reach statistical significance if we're talking 80% and then in some cases, 100% were administered correctly when we get upwards of eight years old. Uh, so I, I think this is a really important chart to have, and it's something that should be in our framework for evaluating this if we are going to work on quality improvement efforts at our own agencies, breaking down by age. Yeah, I love the breakdown by age, and so we, and we mentioned this earlier. It's just it, this is there's a wealth of this looks like a very simple table, but there is a wealth of information in this table. Yep, and then. Moving into a little bit of discussion points here, Alyssa has a great comment, and this is one you know that I, I've wrestled with a little bit as well. Is uh, 
if giving a medication in, into the study was not common, it wasn't all that common, 8% of patients, pediatric patients received any medication, should it have been more common? And that is a point I wish was explored in the study and hopefully can be explored in future studies. Because we beat one of those barriers to giving medication, so like let's say analgesia, for example, uh, because I have this field guide where I don't have to do complex math and I'm not as afraid of giving the wrong dose, would I be more likely to administer analgesia rather than, oh, we're just a few minutes from the hospital, I think I'll wait. Uh, so it would be really interesting to know the proportion of patients, and you know, it's beyond the scope of this paper, but it could certainly be a whole nother paper on its own to say, well, was more dosing conducted now just period, were we giving more medications when they were you know, indicated? Uh, and I think Wake County EMS did a study on this. I remember an abstract presented at NEMSP a couple of years ago now, where they also implemented the Hantevi system and saw that uh, more medications were, were given just in that post period. And now in this study, I didn't see that reported, but I would wager that that's something worth looking into. Yeah, so, so the, the idea here is, um... One of the really interesting parts about this study as we move into the discussion is the authors note that the most studies that have looked into dosing errors uh, have been simulation studies. They've not been um, actual mm -hmm. studies using a field guide in a clinical setting. And the authors were able to get this uh, done in some really challenging circumstances. So um, I, think that, I think this was a, a really well done study. And, and that's a good point too, Tony. You know, a lot of times in simulation studies, we know we're being watched. So there's these other factors that play a role. And in this study, you know, as soon as you implement a new intervention, when the training's still fresh, uh, behavior tends to be a little bit different than it does over time. But this study followed for a very long time. So I would expect that if there were a shift in drift, we would have started to see it in this study. So I think that's another really important point of uh, the study period that was used here. Yeah, I agree. And the authors. Um... You know, they, oh, hey, Dr. Toon. Hello. Please chime in, sir. I believe you are muted. <laughs> <laughs> this makes it even more entertaining for those who can't see it. <laughs> Dr. Toon has been, perp has been not purposefully muted. <laughs> Let me see if I could take him up. Now How's I'm it? unmuted, so. All oh, right. no, now we're in trouble. Welcome aboard. Oh, I've been listening to you two banter back and forth, and Remley, you are such a geek. You know, the fact that you knew, the fact that you knew that those two tests came out at exactly the same time and do the same test only ranked you as higher on the geek scale for me. So. I mean, I thought that we kicked off today on a geeky note. It is Pi Day after all. Yes, yes. It sure is. Happy Pi it Day. It was not going to go uphill from there. <laughs> you were certainly so happy that it was Pi Day, I'm sure. I certainly a, am. It's a holiday for you, so I might trade in tacos for pizza today. Just Ooh. today. <laughs> Ooh, that's a big deal. Um, so there's two things that, uh, well, first of all, I I really do like the study, and I like the fact that it was done uh, with real patients versus simulations, and that that really has a good thing, and it does speak about the strength of field guides in general, and it requires us though to make a shift in the culture of education. Uh, if I could go back many years, I would have been teaching, you know, and I'm talking 30, 40 years ago, I would have taught my students to use references right from the beginning. I think we, we developed this thing that says you're not anything, you're not worth anything unless you can memorize it. And I think that that is what put us into a bad situation with pediatric patients. So I think we need to really make sure the education system allows us to to really emphasize how to teach people to use guides and use them effectively in the educational process and then the transition to the field should be easier and i believe that even the national certification exam will look at that in a similar type of thing if if calculations are an important thing on there you know it's one thing to know oh this is the medication epi i want to give in this situation you know the dose may not be as important on a, a final exam because that should have i mean on a board certification exam because that should have already been rooted out in the education program that the person knows how to calculate the correct dose of, of, of a medication, particularly using, using a guide. But one of the things that I've always struggled with, and you touched on it here, the study touches on it, it's the outcome thing. So you say you overdose the patient, 
what is that what did that really mean right did what did they did they need uh narcan to reverse it did they need uh manual ventilations to support you know if we're talking in the case of fentanyl i i really think having a better understanding of what it was was it a error that led to truly something harmful happening and uh that's where we'll really get into it because it you know i'm certainly guilty in the past history of uh being doing quality and uh, reading things that we sometimes would rake paramedics across the um, coals. And I wasn't mm -hmm. sure it was really worth it because, okay, we gave three tenths more and it was a cardiac arrest patient epi. Did that really have a negative effect? I, I know our goal is, is we want to do the medication correctly, but the point is, is what is, is, is there a, are, are truly a range in there that's safe to operate and then it becomes completely dangerous. So I think that that's something that we need to, as we get better at this, it's something we need to look at. And then the, the final thing is, is why the numbers here are still small. So I think that we need to be careful about broad strokes. You know, we need to have that, you know, the skepticism there when we're dealing with such small numbers, you know, is it really, are there enough numbers here for us to really detect the kind of difference we would like to see or appreciate? So those are just some comments as I, uh, as I, I and I think all of those are good comments and lead us into this, you know, how do we measure patient safety? And that's a really important point. The therapeutic window and Dr. Ward agrees with me, Dr. Toon, that 80 to 120% is kind of a narrow window around that. So it, this study was identifying in my eyes what is known in other work as like a trigger tool. It's a trigger to say that, hey, something could have happened here, not that it did. And that's a really important distinction. So this is looking for trends in areas where we may need to improve, but that doesn't mean that it led to harm. And just because it didn't lead to harm doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it. So these are really great points. Um, another point here around getting that culture built early, I think was you also drew out and, and that's a big deal is, changing it from, you know, it's not a weakness to look at a field guide. And believe me, if I'm the patient, I want you to take all the time you want. Please read that field guide, read it over and over before you give me that dose, right? So we need to change our mentality around, oh, you're weaker if you use that. Uh, it was interesting to me that the errors were found in the most commonly given medications. And we might say, well, yeah, obviously like most common, you're more likely to detect them. But could it also be to some degree that I'm more comfortable using these medications. Maybe I was less likely to consult my feed guide because my field guide because I'm confident in that medication and then I'm more likely to make a mistake versus if I never give a medication, I'm surely going to go look it up and make sure that I get the right dose. And my last thought around this is um, in terms of we're using age-based dosing here that translates to a weight, of course, the ideal body weight for age. Uh, and there are indications within this tool that they used that say, if a child is very large or very small for age, how you should adjust and whether you should potentially use the length based tape to estimate the weight or estimate the weight in a different way. I'm not sure how that would get accounted for in an EPCR. That would be a challenge because we're gonna document the patient's birthday and that's gonna tell us their age. And then I believe that these underdosing and overdosing were based on that more so unless the field length was documented somewhere else. So those are just some things for us to think about. Um, and I agree with your point 100% about small sample size. We shouldn't run off and say, this is the best thing ever. This is the thing we have to do. But there is a worthwhile signal in this data set that says we should certainly continue to pursue work in this area. If we're going to target additional resources, it makes sense to do so in this arena. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, in, in pediatrics, hopefully if Dr. Antevi listens to this, he probably mm -hmm. could flip around or be upset. He'll he'll deal with me later, but uh, oh, I'm sure he I, will. I really, but he he does agree. We this whole thing about confidence, you know, mm -hmm. I really do think the, the why there are certainly physiological differences with pediatric patients and anatomical differences that are based upon age. They're still people, and if you get really good at taking care of adults, you can you should have the same confidence in taking care of kids. Because the one thing you touched on earlier is are there patients out here that should have been treated that weren't? This is not just limited to the pediatric population. This is a question throughout all of the patient populations. Why are there people that didn't get treated? Why didn't they get their pain managed? Or why didn't they correct their glucose? Or um, why hypotension is one, you know, we don't use that many inotropic agents, you know, so mm -hmm. 
are there patient are there just that few of patients to get inotropic agents? And the same thing can be said for even the studies that are now coming, small still with blood, you know, are are there patients that should have gotten blood that didn't? You know, so the, it becomes a really interesting thing is about um, you know, are we missing patients? How good is our diagnosis? And I know that uh, you know, ESO with its tool to try to match hospital data to field data is an essential thing, but that's with anything. We need to know what happened on the other end because that's the only way we're really gonna start to close that gap um, is to really understand that bigger picture, let alone you know, how we educate people. But I think there's a lot of patients that probably deserve to be treated that aren't, and there could be a, some very valid reasons. I'm not saying it's an absolute, but should the percentage be higher or do we even know what the minimum percentage should be? Yeah, and I think that's a really key point. And Tony and I have been doing uh, analgesia research for patients with long bone fractures and a pain score that indicates severe pain and we're seeing treatment is in less than half. And there's a ton of barriers to that. There's really great qualitative research that complements some of this work, looking at what are the barriers and do these barriers differ by patient's age? So. For example, IV access might be a major challenge in a you know, six month old, but perhaps in my mental model, that's less of a challenge as we get to a 15 year old. Um, but these are all really important points here. Um, and we're getting a couple of great comments from the audience that I do want to make sure that we bring in and a key point in about how the dosing is determined. So I see two comments here that relate to this, uh, one of them from Abraham and one from Dr. Ward. So. It, in this system, this field guide that was used for this study, we're talking about age-based determination of ideal body weight. And that's a really key distinction here. So if we ask the parent for what is the child's actual weight, that could be really different from what is the ideal body weight. And not all medications were created equal. So we talk about, you know, uh, only a SIP deals in absolutes. It's neither good nor bad. It, it's good under the right circumstances. And so knowing which medications uh, metabolize in which ways is also really important to pay attention to in this kind of work, I think. Um, and then we have another comment here about people treating pediatric patients differently and how that creates unnecessary stress and complexity and, and these additional barriers. Completely agree with that. Uh, and there was a note above, this field guide started out for, the hand system started out for pediatric patients, but now the same logic holds true. It's complex to do math for children. It's also complex to do math for adults in the pre-hospital setting. And so this tool can also be applied to adult patients. And that makes a lot of sense. All right, I know that we are going I ahead. know we're getting towards the end. Just one quick thing that you'd mentioned on earlier, and I, want to reinf I wanted to touch back on it, is error reporting, is the fact that we really don't have an effective system. I mean, we can go on not just error reporting as it deals with patient safety, we really don't understand well how many people are injured on the job, right. you know, when it comes to people who are EMS providers, you know, so we can't even create solutions if we don't have the data to even create a solution, you know, and I think that we have to find some way to um, really find out what is the magnitude of whatever we're dealing with, you know, and and that's and 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 that's been a problem for my 45 plus years of doing this is not knowing it, and it's certainly we hear about it more now because of the internet compared to when I first started, you know, with the stone tablets and smoke signals. But it 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 is it is really different now, and I'm not sure. Is you know, one of the things I say, people talk about, well, there's there were lots of back injuries. Well, I, there may have been lots of back injuries even when I started. We just didn't know it as well now when everything gets reported so much or how many ambulance accidents are. You hear about it so much more since I can look at national news now where I never was able to do that, uh, you know, at the start of the stuff. So I'm not really sure how new something is. Is it, Maybe these have been problems around for just ages and we've just, again, we don't know the magnitude so we can't correct the problem. Right. Not being able to measure it makes it challenging to improve. And I think in order to be able to measure it, we have to set up the right infrastructure. And what I mean by infrastructure is, first of all, a culture that allows that reporting where we are going to blame the system and not the person in the system for what's and that's not to say zero accountability. There's a whole, you know, a whole podcast we could have on just culture and what that actually means. But that's a huge piece in order to even be able to have an error reporting. And then I have seen in the past few years and I've had the privilege of working on some projects around patient uh, safety, 
I've seen an emergence of patient safety organizations, which makes it a safe place to report errors and near misses so that we can undertake some of these improvement projects to you know, engineer that error out so that it can't occur again, whether that mean you know, changing the medication labeling or what, however, there's a bajillion different interventions you can imagine, but first steps right, you're absolutely right, is we have to measure it so that we know where we should target our limited time and resources. And you you mentioned something, and I just, uh, only because this is my wife's area of expertise, is mm -hmm. we need to have people that do retail research help us with packaging. Because right? there is an unbelievable, there's an unbelievable science, science that goes on there. And, and she does, she does everywhere in her research work that includes uh, eye tracking, galvanic skin reaction, physically where things are placed. I mean, the amount of research they do for retail is just astronomical. And the, the, the thing is, is most of us don't know we're being researched because they don't have consent <laughs> things the same as we do yeah. in medicine. Well, in EMS, we're so used to adapting and overcoming that who cares if we have to tear this thing with our teeth or do it one hand? You know, we're just so used to dealing with bad packaging um, that it, it, that demand hasn't been there. But I would love to see more of these cross industry studies and aviation is certainly an area. Retail is one that I hadn't considered. I love that. But um, that reminds me of another really good book called Range, where you can see if you borrow from different fields, uh, you're more likely to solve um, some issues that have been around for a long time and just haven't moved, like packaging and EMS. That's a huge one. And now I know we are getting really close to the end of time, but I do want to, uh, first of all, thank the audience for all of these great comments. And if we weren't able to get to them, let's keep this discussion going on Twitter or on your social media venue of choice. And I will give our panelists uh, some time for some last words. So Tony, I'll start with you. Uh, your last thoughts around this particular article that we reviewed today. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think this was a well done article. I think it was, it was, a lot harder than to, to complete than it might appear on its face. And I want to commend the authors not only for getting it published, but for also, if you, I, I really hope that everyone has a chance to read this full manuscript. The authors do a really good job of not only putting their results into context, but really outlining their limitations, some of them we discussed today, and uh, talking about work for the future. Um, so yeah, I, I commend the authors. I think it's a great study. I hope everyone gets a chance to read the full manuscript. Absolutely. And Bill, last thoughts from you for takeaways for the audience. Again, I agree with Tony and everything that he said. I believe in field guides for all levels. We need to get away. We need to get people to be referencing so we can decrease errors regardless of the age of the patient. You know, I think it's essential. Checklists have a bit an important role, I think, also in the future, uh, the way we use them, particularly for the low frequency you know, uh, high risk type situations. I think that they're really important. And hopefully this is just the start of more similar research and that we can make it in the real world and not in simulation. Absolutely, and, and I'll echo that. Kudos to the authors for taking on this study, which was surely not an easy study. And it is, you know, a start to what I hope is a, are plenty of more studies in this area to confirm these findings and stretch them further. Um, and I would, again, like to thank all of our listeners today, appreciate your participation, and again, hope that this is the beginning of what could be an improvement conversation for our industry. So this study has certainly shed some light on some areas where there's likely a larger need for quality improvement. And so I hope that this is something that you'll take home and start measuring in your own data at the local level and start brainstorming the drivers that are leading to these results and how we can change those. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna cut the nerding out really short now. Uh, as a reminder, we have the education, in case you just can't get enough of the nerding out. Education research is going to be on Friday, March 25th, and then we will be back here with the clinical podcast on the second Monday of the month, which will be April 11th at noon central. Uh, thank you all again for listening and look forward to seeing you all next time.